In the previous lesson, we introduced the steady state analysis and the Fourier's law. In this lesson, we will learn more about thermal conductivity and how it needs to be considered while designing various products. Based on our experience, we know that some materials conduct heat at a faster rate as compared to others. For example, metals are very good conductors of heat. That is why we always use oven mitts when taking a baking tray out of the oven. Plastic, on the other hand, is not a good conductor of heat, which is why we can hold the handle of a hot iron without burning our hands. Thermal conductivity of a material is a measure of its intrinsic ability to conduct heat. To define the thermal conductivity of a material, let's go back to the Fourier's law from the previous lesson. Fourier's law states that heat flux, indicated by Q, is equal to the negative product of the thermal conductivity K and the temperature gradient. The negative sign indicates that the heat flows from a higher temperature region to a lower temperature region. In this equation, if we have a unit temperature gradient across the material, then the thermal conductivity is numerically equal to the heat flux through the material. Thus, thermal conductivity of a material can be defined as the heat flux transmitted through that material due to a unit temperature gradient under steady state conditions. It is a material property just like Young's modulus or the yield strength of a material. In the international system of units, thermal conductivity is measured in watts per meter Kelvin. In the US customary unit system, thermal conductivity may be measured in BTU per hour feet degree Fahrenheit, where BTU stands for British Thermal Unit. But in this course, we will be using the SI units. To understand this unit better, let's look at a simple example. Consider a cube which is 2 meters by 2 meters by 3 meters in dimensions. Let's say that 60 joules of heat flows in 5 seconds in the x direction. So the heat flow rate is 12 watts. Since the area normal to the x direction is 2 times 2 that is 4 meters square, the heat flux in that direction is 3 watt per meter square. The temperature gradient in x direction is minus 10 by 3 Kelvin per meter. The thermal conductivity of a material is equal to the heat flux divided by the temperature gradient which in this case is 0 0.9 watt per meter Kelvin. The table here shows representative values of thermal conductivity for some materials. Typically, metals are good conductors of heat and have very high thermal conductivity, while non-metals and gases have low thermal conductivity and may act as good insulators of heat. As you can see from this table, Thermal conductivity of different materials may differ vastly by several orders of magnitude. For example, air has a thermal conductivity of 0.023 watt per meter Kelvin, while the thermal conductivity of silver is more than 10,000 times larger. Thermal conductivity is an important factor that engineers have to consider while designing a wide range of products. While designing thermal products, it is common to use a combination of materials with very different thermal conductivities. For example, in order to maintain the hot temperature of liquids, 
Thermos flasks are designed to have two walls with a vacuum in between them. This vacuum prevents heat loss through conduction, thus preserving the heat of the liquid inside. Another example is the kettle. Although the body of a kettle might be made of metal, its handle is made of plastic so that we can safely pick it up. Thermal conductivity may be affected by a number of factors like impurities and porosity. Increasing the amount of impurities in a material reduces its thermal conductivity. For steel with only 1% carbon, the thermal conductivity is 40% lower than that of pure iron. In case of porous materials, the pores are generally filled with air, which has a very low thermal conductivity. Due to this reason, increasing the porosity of a material reduces its overall thermal conductivity. This is why porous materials such as styrofoam are good insulators and are often used for insulating houses. Another important factor affecting thermal conductivity is temperature. Thermal conductivity of most metals reduces with an increase in temperature, while that of non-metals increases with an increase in temperature. Hence, it is important to consider the temperature range in which a product operates when performing thermal analysis to evaluate its performance. This dependence of thermal conductivity on temperature causes the Fourier's law to become non-linear because temperature is an unknown. For example, let's consider a one-dimensional heat conduction problem for a case when the thermal conductivity is independent of the temperature. When we integrate the Fourier's law, we get a linear relation between the heat flux and the temperature. On the other hand, if we assume that the thermal conductivity is inversely proportional to the temperature, we get a non-linear relation between the heat flux and the temperature. For cases in which the dependence of thermal conductivity on temperature is not so simple and the geometry is complex, it may not be possible to obtain analytical solutions. In such cases, we rely on numerical methods to solve the problem. Let's have a look at the Fourier's law in finite element format. When the conductivity is temperature dependent, it means that the conductivity matrix K in this equation varies with temperature. If we plot the relationship between heat flow and the temperature, it becomes a non-linear curve. To solve such non-linear systems, the newton raphson method is commonly used in finite element analysis to find the numerical solution. It starts with an assumed value of conductivity and by balancing the internal and external heat flow in multiple iterations, the numerical solution is obtained. For a more detailed discussion of the newton raphson method, you can refer to our previous course titled Method of Solving Problems. So until now, we have been writing the Fourier's equation in a scalar form. That is, the thermal conductivity and the heat flux had no directions associated with them. This was based on the assumption that we were dealing with isotropic materials. Isotropic materials have identical values of thermal conductivity in all the directions. However, in the more general form of Fourier's law, the heat flux is a vector while the thermal conductivity is a tensor. Such materials can have different values of thermal conductivity in different directions and are known as anisotropic materials. Typically, 
most homogeneous materials are isotropic and have the same value of thermal conductivity in all the directions. However, some materials such as rocks and composites may have different thermal conductivities in different directions. A common example that we come across every day is the printed circuit board or PCB that is used in most of the electronics. A PCB is composed of alternating layers of copper and polymer. Due to this reason, the effective thermal conductivity of the PCB in the through thickness direction is about 100 times smaller than its effective in-plane thermal conductivity. Careful consideration needs to be given while performing thermal analysis on such materials. After going through this lesson, hopefully you have a better understanding of the thermal conductivity of various materials. We also learned about the different factors that affect thermal conductivity and about materials that behave in an anisotropic manner. When using simulations to design a product, all these factors need to be considered to ensure that we get realistic and useful results. In the following lessons, we will learn more about such simulations and about using their results to guide the design process.